Japan Station is made possible in part by Patreon support. If you would like to make sure that I can keep bringing you more content like this, then head on over to japankyo.com slash Patreon and sign up for as little as $1 a month. Welcome to Japan Station, a production of japankyo.com. I'm your host, Tony Vega. Just a quick thank you here at the top of the show. Well, for, first of all, thank you to Alex KT Martin, my previous guest, uh, for sharing the show on Twitter because that seems like uh, it raised a little bit of awareness about Japan Station and brought in at least a few new listeners because, uh, well, I, I heard from a couple new listeners that discovered the show with the previous episode. So thank you so much for giving the show a shot. Glad you enjoyed it. If you have not done so yet, you definitely should check out the previous episode because, um, well, Alex is a writer for the Japan Times and he recently wrote this amazing series of articles about the Japanese wolf, which is supposedly extinct, but there's a whole lot more to the story than just that. So maybe go check out the articles, but also go check out the episode. Uh, again, it's the one right before this one. There will be a link in the show notes. So thank you to any new listeners and thank you to all the old listeners. Glad you are sticking around and enjoying the content. So let's get into today's episode. So my guest today is an anthropologist of religion and a PhD candidate at the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultural Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Her name is Caitlin Ugaritz. <laughs> so it's a long intro, but Caitlin, really wonderful person, really fun, super smart. We talked about a whole bunch of kind of religion related things and Marie Kondo and a, a little bit, a little bit of anime stuff because uh, Caitlin also runs this this really, really interesting YouTube channel called Eat, Pray, Anime. So right off the bat, I will say that if you enjoy the kind of content that I produce here, I think that you'll probably enjoy her videos. She does super in-depth looks at Japanese animation and games, uh, and she draws on her own knowledge that comes from, well, being a PhD candidate with an expertise on Shinto. Uh, and so there's, of course, a lot of Japanese media out there that draws on Shinto and Japanese culture, and, and there's so much that can be said about these things, and she does it in a really great way over on her YouTube channel. Again, it's called Eat, Pray, anime highly recommend it link in the show notes uh but today actually we're going to be mostly talking about well two main topics first of all marie kondo or <laughs> in japanese she's well kondo maria but in the u.s she's known as marie kondo right this uh tidying up guru uh that has become known for well i guess she she's known quite well for the whole sparking joy thing, the konmari method. Um, and, and well, in Japanese, it, it's not sparking joy. It's, it's the kyun that you feel in your chest, right? So, <laughs> um, really, really interesting person that I've been um, kind of perplexed by in a way. And uh, recently, Caitlin wrote an article about uh, Marie Kondo. It's called The Untidiness of Marie Kondo's Eclectic Spirituality. And it was a really interesting article. That was what originally caught my attention about uh, Caitlin. I, I didn't know about her YouTube channel, but through that article, I learned about her YouTube channel and I went like, oh my God, I got to talk to Caitlin. She's <laughs> talking about stuff that I, I really like to talk about. So um, I, I do recommend checking out the article, but today we are going to talk about that general topic of untidiness, quote unquote, and Marie Kondo and kind of, you know, what why she is kind of popular in the US and maybe not so popular in Japan. Um, and then after that, we're going to talk about uh, Caitlin's kind of, well, I guess her PhD research, uh, her main area uh, of interest and, and research, which is online Shinto communities. Um, and that's another really interesting topic. So that's kind of the two main things that we'll talk about. And then we'll close it out a little bit with uh, Eat, Pray, Anime and her stuff that she does on YouTube, which again, you should totally go check out. But I'll leave it at that. Here it is, my conversation with Caitlin Ugaritz. The next stop is Japan Station. The doors on the right side will open. Um, in the, in the article that, that you, you write, you know, you, in, in, in the very headline, it says like the untidiness of, of Maria Kondo. So I'm, I'm 
curious, like, obviously, you know, that that's, I thought that was a great headline. It's right away, you know, really gets you curious. Um, what What is this untidiness that you're referring to in the article? Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, if anybody's not familiar with the, the publishing process for op-eds in uh, venues like Religion News Service or the Washington Post, where my article was uh, published, you don't always get to pick the title as the writer. Uh, so it was kind of a, a cooperative effort uh, between myself and the editor. But the, the word untidy was always going to be in the title, because I think one of the most interesting things about uh, Marie Kondo, Kondo Marie, uh, Marie Kondo, Marie, yeah, Marie <laughs> she goes Kondo, by I know. <laughs> a, a, a number of names uh, between uh-huh. like her books and her in-person you know, appearances and her Netflix yeah. series. Um, but what's so interesting about her is that everyone's trying to pin her down and put her in a box. A lot mm-hmm. like the way she teaches people to put, <laughs> you know, categorize things, put them in their boxes and they have a permanent place and they, it does not change. Um, mm-hmm. But when I was looking at the kind of the religious inspirations and tropes that uh, Marie Kondo, I'll call her here, yeah. um, plays on are really complicated, really untidy. Yeah. And so I wanted in this article to kind of start picking that apart. I w- had lots of people in my life, you know, just regular people, people in the classroom, colleagues asking me, you know, have you heard about this Marie Kondo? Mm-hmm. What's up with her? And uh, looking at the different articles on her, everybody wants to pin her down as right. one thing or another. Uh, in the beginning, there was a HuffPost article um, that said, you know, she is uh, practicing this like Japanese heritage, this Shinto animism. A great colleague of mine, Dr. Julian Thomas at the University of Pennsylvania, had a great uh, article and podcast on how Marie, what Marie Kondo is doing is not Shinto mm-hmm. per se. So then the question uh, to my mind was, well, then what is she doing? Mm-hmm. And so I, I started looking. I consumed a lot of media about Marie Kondo, which is exactly what she wanted, yeah. right? A uh, shrewd marketer <laughs> that she is. And I started picking up on all sorts of things because, you know, my my research focus is Shinto. I'm all about Shinto. Uh-huh. So I wanted to see what people were picking up on. So I read her books and, and went through her, her website and everything. Her website is a treasure trove. Really? Um, but what really uh, struck me when I was looking through her website, which didn't come out until 2019, was that there, there's a rituals section. And I thought, bingo, if I'm going to look at the religion of uh, Marie Kondo, uh, you know, let's see what she writes about rituals, the ones that are important to her. Mm-hmm. And there was there's one post, it's six purification methods that Marie Kondo uses in her life, according to the article. Uh-huh. And the first one was uh, burning Palo Santo wood, um, which is this sort of holy wood that is grown in the Central Americas, uh-huh. um, decidedly not Shinto. <laughs> and the more I read through the article, there, it had very little to do with Shinto, even though the beginning of the article started with, in Japan, there are many ways <laughs> to purify your space. Uh-huh. And in Shinto, this is called Harai. But there's nothing particularly Shinto about Palo Santo wood yeah. or later in the article, uh, rose quartz crystals and tuning forks. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I became even more interested in what she was doing because it wasn't just Shinto, but it was a mishmash. It was like a really eclectic group of, of uh-huh. things. And so I, that for me is the untidiness of Marie Kondo. She has all of these different spiritual traditions that she draws upon um, in order to market herself and kind of curate her brand. So what she's doing is not, you know, the the Japanese way of tidying or the Shinto way of tidying. It's really, you know, it's the Konmari method. It's whatever strikes her and her audience's mm-hmm. fancy. And in this case, it's it's not just one thing. Um, it's it's many things. It's the entire global culture and history of spirituality that she draws upon. And I think that's what makes her so interesting to a number of yeah, different yeah. people. Like I, I hadn't watched um, her, her show. Um, but before this, I, I specifically watched the first episode just to get a better idea of kind of what she does. I mean, I, I was aware of, you know, the whole like, does it spark joy in the cute and all that? I mean, that's basically become a meme at this point. But um, I, I found it really interesting how, there's these 
Okay, so every every few years you get this new kind of cleanup guru, and and you know it's this like constant cycle. You always get a new person, but and, and it's not that I keep track of them, but at least with her, what I saw was like you know you start by thanking the house, and you start and then you thank the the clothes, and then you know there's this all this there's this other. It's not just like do this, do this, do this um, in this kind of dry clinical way. There's this other. You could say, I guess, spiritual element to it that, at least to me, from my memory, kind of st- makes her stand out with some of the other cleanup gurus that I, I have in my recent memory. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, there, there's definitely a spiritual edge to Marie Kondo, which is what makes her so interesting for a lot of people, I think. But yes, she's she's one of many tidying gurus <laughs> um, in Japan mm-hmm. and also around the world. You know, people have been really taken with Marie Kondo in in the U.S. Um, and treating her like she's something new. And so I've been trying to figure out yeah. what is that newness because, you know, I'm very familiar with Martha Stewart and sort of all of the um, – all of the things that she's engaged in with the tidying and the home presentation and the cooking and the holiday stuff. Um, but I had never watched so much HGTV as I have during the pandemic. <laughs> I, my, my mother is, is a fan of those kinds of shows. So they've kind of been on in the background yeah. these past 18 months. And I started seeing so many similarities with Marie Kondo, um, more than I had thought of previously. There are lots of other um, organizational um, strategists, consultants, coaches um, that have their own particular methods. I can't remember what her name is or even what the show is called, but mm-hmm. one person like um, categorizes types of people and their organization styles according to like different kinds of insects. So it's uh-huh. really important <laughs> in the in the maybe oversaturated market yeah. of uh, tidying folks <laughs> that y- you need your own spin on things um and so yeah marie kondo definitely has found kind of more of a spiritual wellness positivity (laughs) um edge to things that i think uh, people particularly um outside of japan uh respond Mm -hmm. to Um, but she's one of many similar tidying consultants in japan and it's funny that when their books are also translated like marie kondo's have been they are also t- often subtitled like the Japanese way right, of tidying, right, right. <laughs> which really points out, you know, that there is no one Japanese way yeah. of tidying. For example, um, one of Marie Kondo's colleagues, Yamashita Hideko, has her Dunshari uh, method. Um, uh-huh. She started publishing about Dunshari in 2009. Um, and it's, it's very mm-hmm. similar in many ways. Um, in Dan Shari, Dan is to refuse to consume more mm-hmm. things. Uh, the Sha is to get rid of the clutter that mm-hmm. you have, you know, so you stop the, the input, you stop, you increase the output. <laughs> and then, uh, Ri, uh, part in Dan Shari is to, you know, separate your notions of happiness and, and satisfaction from material goods. And sort of reclaim the time and space to have um, contentness and, and joy in your life, which was, is called uh, yutori. This comes mm. from the 1980s that uh, Yamashita draws upon. So there are a lot of parallels um, with Marie Kondo's thing as well. And I, I thought it was interesting before mm. our talk today, I looked up some of the recent uh, Rediscovery is of the Danshari method because people are looking more into Marie Kondo and other Japanese, quote unquote, mm-hmm. ways of tidying. And um, uh, the language about Danshari has started picking up this sparking oh. joy um, idea that, that Marie Kondo started that uh, I think she has mm-hmm. trademarked at this point. So that's pretty, pretty interesting that Marie Kondo is coloring our ideas of what Japanese tidying is, if there is such a thing yeah, as like Japanese it- tidying. <laughs> Like, I mean, it, it's great to tidy up and, and it, it, that's all wonderful stuff. But it, it always like when, when she started picking up steam in the U.S., it always kind of perplexed me in that, like, to me, she was nothing particularly unique in that I had seen plenty other people like her on Japanese TV. And to me also, 
I had never seen her make this like huge impact on Japanese media in the way that I've seen her do in, in the US. So it always kind of like, what, but what was it about her that really like caught people's attention? Like it, it always, I don't know, confused me. So yeah, it's, it's just. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's marketing, I guess. Huh? She was she was she had a nice combination and then somebody latched onto her. I, I, I don't know. Exactly. To a T. Yeah. It's it's totally a marketing strategy, um, trading on ideas and the, like the aesthetics of Japanese ness. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Marie Kondo does not have the same kind of cultural cachet in Japan because, mm-hmm. you know, there are so many other people like her. And in fact, in 2019, there was a Japan Times article um, that said that many people in Japan, and they don't cite their sources, which always irks me, but they said many people in Japan criticized Kondo, especially for the kind of pseudo-religious or the spiritual aspects of mm-hmm. her uh, brand. And so actually her branding almost backfired in Japan in a mm. way that there were many other choices to choose from that didn't make people uncomfortable when it came to different approaches to spirituality. Um, mm. But once her book was translated into English, I mean, it was almost immediately a bestseller. And within two years, Marie Kondo moved to Los Angeles. I mean, she lives in, a, in the United States now, and that's where she's building her tidying empire. Mm. Um, so I definitely think that in the U.S., this kind of focus on on spirituality, but also notions of Japanese ness, are extremely appealing um, for for a number of reasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't consume tons of Japanese television, but the only this was probably several years ago at this point. But the only time that I really mentioned that I remember her being featured in some prominent way on Japanese TV was when they were telling her story of like kind of how she rose to prominence and the focus as far as I remember this was a few years ago but really the focus was how hard she pushes herself how how hard working she is and how she even like pushed herself to the point of exhaustion at some point and, and this and that so it wasn't like I don't know the, the the narrative seemed a bit different from what you typically get in the U.S., and 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 like I said, this was several years ago at this point. I don't hear like any talk of her these days, but yeah, she's all the rage. Definitely. Yeah, yeah she's not the same. She's not the same phenomenon mm-hmm. that she is here in, in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and the the kinds of things that she sells to bring it back to Kondo's online store uh, are a lot less uh, special in Japan than they are in the United States. Um, for example, the best sellers on her, her store are uh, like a desktop Zen garden, uh, kintsugi <laughs> lacquer repair kits, yeah. ikebana flower arranging tools, uh, chopsticks, and incense. <laughs> and I mean, you can get that stuff yeah. pretty much anywhere in you Japan. Like I mean, you can go to Muji shop, right? and get it pretty cheaply. <laughs> yeah, like go to Daiso. Yeah. <laughs> go, to, go to Don Quixote. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are a lot of places that you could get uh, the same things much more cheaply. Yeah. But in the U.S., um, there's so much more cultural allure. There's this kind of, you know, Orientalist mystery yeah, around yeah, her. Yeah. And I mean, she can upcharge yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> um, everything in her store. Wow. I mean, so expensive. Oh, really? <laughs> but at the same time, there's something for for uh-huh. everybody um, you can you can get the quartz crystals and the tuning <laughs> forks. You can get aromatherapy uh, materials. Uh-huh. You can get a uh, pine scented lip balm from Finland. Whoa, interesting! Um, so, like, even the people, like for example, like uh-huh. myself, I you know I, I study Japan. I've been to Japan a number of times. The the Japan stuff is is not so appealing right. to me. Um, I mean, honestly, neither is the the quartz crystals, although they, they look very pretty and shiny. Yeah. Uh, I really want the the finished lip balm. <laughs> <laughs> My friends know that I love to smell like a tree. Like I just, you know, forests are wonderful. Mm-hmm. So there's really something there for everybody. It's I think it's very strategic. It's curated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the kind of lifestyle that she's selling. That you know these um, expensive, very highly prized aesthetic goods. Right. Um, can bring you joy and that she's the person that you can get them right, from right. yeah i mean I'm, I'm starting like as you're describing all this i'm thinking gwyneth paltrow goop like <laughs> you know so, exactly exactly yeah. there there are a number of things on her store that are exactly 
like goop. Um, a lot of the crystals, like water bottles and crystals and things. Uh-huh. Uh, there have been some interesting comparisons of Gwyneth Paltrow and Marie Kondo. But one of the things that I've noticed and one of the articles I read noticed is that uh, Gwyneth Paltrow does not come under the same kind of fire that Marie Kondo has uh-huh. um, for selling the same things. There's There was a huge backlash in 2019 when uh, Kondo's store launched because, you know, originally in her, her first TV show and in her books, she says, you don't need to buy things right, to be happy. Right. You can, you know, decide what in your home sparks mm-hmm. joy and you don't have to, you know, go out and get special containers you can use cardboard boxes and things like that which i think appealed to a lot of people and i think some people felt betrayed when she opened the store and then decided she was going to sell you like 50 dollar bamboo baskets <laughs> <laughs> which she features in her new netflix show there's a oh, whole really? section of her uh store that says as seen on oh. netflix um her whole house in the show is staged with these things that you can then purchase on her store and i i wonder if they started out as things that sparked joy Uh for her or uh if they were just placed in the house during filming i'm very very curious Um, so in the in the second season you get to see her house yes um Mm -hmm. so there are two marie kondo shows there's the earlier tidying up with marie kondo which is your basic going into a home of a family learning about them tidying Mm -hmm. up emotional breakdown emotional catharsis yeah, yeah. Uh, she leaves, and the world is much a better place. I mean, so um, not the to interrupt you, but the, just came the out first episode. First, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, not to interrupt you. The first episode that I saw, I couldn't help but think that couple has way bigger problems than just like an untidy house. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, that's kind of the psychology of these tidying shows, not just yeah. Marie Kondo's, but I mean, her first book is titled The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. And so the whole philosophy of, of the KonMari method and a lot of these other uh-huh. tidying st- strategists, I don't know what to call them, coaches, I guess, as well is that by tidying your, you know, external surroundings, you will also, you know, bring harmony to your your inner life. It will improve your relationships with other people. There's definitely a mm. narrative of self transformation um, mm. in all of these shows. That's part of the reason why we watch them. Aside yeah. from maybe uh, feeling a little better that our houses might not be quite as untidy as theirs are, <laughs> True. and then we feel good about ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, you know, it's the narrative of the family finding more time to spend together or, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. the couple who is having yeah, marriage issues, yeah. communication issues. Sure. Mm-hmm. Sure. I mean, there's a reason why that appeals to us. It's it's yeah. very it's got a lot of pathos, pathos. Sure, sure. Um, so the second series, Sparking Joy with Marie Kondo, the tagline is. Uh, the home was only the beginning. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so Marie Kondo kind of steps. I know. Uh-huh. I The first time I heard that, I thought it sounded like a horror movie. <laughs> like, Marie Kondo takes over the world. Yeah. The home was only the beginning. Like, hide your sweaters. Yeah. So... <laughs> So in the second show, uh, Sparking Joy of Marie Kondo, she steps out of the house and she goes to people's places of businessness, particularly. Uh And this is kind of a tie in with one of her newest books, which is something about finding joy at work. I haven't read it. Okay, (laughs) Um, I've only read the first two. Mm -hmm. I've I've heard I've heard it's very similar, but she she goes out into people's places of employment. There's um, a garden center in the first episode and then a coffee shop. Um, and somehow she always finds a way to go back into people's houses, <laughs> which I think might be her comfort zone. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of this expansion of her philosophy that, um, you know, f- using her methods and uh, thinking about what sparks joy can have a transformative effect on, you know, your business relationships, your work life balance, things like that. And so each of the episodes, and there's only three, I was very oh, disappointed really? to see because oh. there was less material for me to work sure. with. I was very surprised. Yeah. We'll see if it gets green lit for season two. Uh-huh. Um, but each of the episodes is titled in such a way that that emotional connection and that personal transformation is actually the focus of the show oh, okay, okay okay interesting all right well she's she's growing bigger 
She's so, so smart. <laughs> as yeah. much as I, I might argue, mm-hmm. you know, what she's doing is not terribly Shinto yeah. um, or, you know, like I crystals, take them or leave them. Yeah. Um, not bashing any of that. Yeah. She's such a smart marketer. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's it's and, amazing. And she's really super she's, hardworking. I'm she's sure too. capitalized yeah. on the. Oh, I, I'm yeah. sure she's capitalized on the intersection of like all of these cultural um, interests that people have in Japan yeah. and tidying and relationships and, and you know neoliberal <laughs> po- capitalism <laughs> and, and trying to figure out what work life balance yeah. is. Uh, if Marie Kondo could do that for me, that would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's um, what I mean. That's one aspect of of what makes her so appealing, right? That we all want in one way or another, what she's selling, right? We all want this work-life balance. We all want this joy. We all want it. What what comes, what the difference is, is like maybe her method doesn't work for me, but her method does seem to work for a whole lot of people, at least in, in terms of like it's appealing and, and you want to at least read her books and watch her shows and, and find out what she has to say. Totally, totally. Well, and then yeah. the focus on sparking joy is yeah. so clever, because oh, yeah. Yeah. it's really personal. You get to decide what is meaningful to you and, and what is appealing. Yeah. And so it really is kind of one size fits all and yet yeah. deeply personal and intimate. And I think she's yeah. really struck gold with that concept. Yeah. And and even there, like what, what's so interesting, like even there, she she adds this Japanese-ness to it where, you know, she, she will sometimes throw in the Japanese kyun. And then in that first episode, again, that I saw, of course, the, the two American, the couples, they, they, all, they reacted. <laughs> they kind of laughed when she said the kyun, you know, so there's this kind of like, I don't know. Maybe to some people it's conscious, maybe to some people it's subconscious, but this this uh, kawaii-ness to it, this cuteness to it, right? So there's this other level to it as well, I think. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, mm. Marie Kondo's own aesthetics are definitely part of the brand. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so then let, let's talk a little bit about Shinto, because you said your larger research is is mainly focused on, on Shinto. So could you tell us about like what what your focus is, and then we can kind of dig deeper into that? Sure. So, yes, my mm-hmm. dissertation research, I'm a Ph.D. candidate at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And I'm mm-hmm. first and foremost, I'm a digital anthropologist. So sometimes I joke that uh, I s- Facebook stalk people for a living. <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, <laughs> I'm really interested. For the of the world. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I'm the world's most not creepy Facebook stalker. <laughs> I have good intentions. No, no. In all, in all seriousness, um, I'm really interested in online religious communities, how Mm -hmm. offline religious communities use digital technology and media. Uh, Part of this comes out of my own background. Uh, My father is the minister of a small Presbyterian church in upstate New York. Mm. So I've always Mm -hmm. grown up in sort of the behind the scenes of religious communities. Uh, And Uh I've, you know, seen firsthand struggling with trying to get the the audio system to work and how do we live stream (laughs) services during uh, yeah. the pandemic and things like that. And, you know, Shinto communities are working on these issues as well. A lot of religious communities, particularly during the global COVID-19 pandemic, have had to deal with, if not embrace, this digital turn um, mm-hmm. in response to um, social distancing restrictions and lockdowns and things like that. Um, but prior to the pandemic, I was working on this project with online Shinto communities because we often hear Shinto defined by um, Shinto organizations like the Jinja Honcho or anime or, you know, mm-hmm. uh, a po- uh, books for popular consumption that Shinto is the like indigenous or native faith or religion of the Japanese people and the land of Japan. And this definition has always kind of fascinated me. And I thought, well, is like, what's the best way to think about this idea of indigeneity and nativeness? Mm. Like, what does that really mean? And one of the most interesting ways for me to study that, to really turn that idea around is to look at Shinto outside of Japan 
uh, primarily as it's practiced by non-Japanese people. That's about as far away from that definition as mm. you can get. Mm -hmm. um, and so I study these communities of uh, Shinto practitioners online who come from all around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, predominantly, they're from the United States, but there are lots and lots of people from Europe, from um, Australia, New Zealand, all over the world. Um, people are really interested in Shinto and have started to practice it as a ritual tradition. Mm. So I study that as an anthropologist. Mm. Now what, I mean, like, are Japanese people religious? What is Shinto? Like, these are these classic questions that get thrown around a lot when you start to talk about these topics. And then, you know, it's like, what one thing you can say is like most people in Japan don't really identify as Shinto anyway. They they just kind of do a few things that could fall under the Shinto umbrella. What what is Shinto practice then? That's a great question. That's a really tough one to answer, <laughs> and uh, I'm probably gonna do some little dodges there. But, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Well, tell is, us what you can. What is Shinto practice? Sure. Well, yeah. At the center of a lot of Shinto practice is a Shinto shrine for, mm -hmm. for people who aren't familiar yeah. with Shinto or maybe haven't been to Japan. Um, these mm -hmm. are, you know, structures that uh, within them house a, an object that in which the Shinto deity is called Kami um, reside. Mm -hmm. You can call them down through various um, formulas. You could maybe call them prayers. They're called Norito in Japanese. Um, mm -hmm. And people give offerings to the kami, hold festivals, um, you know, make requests, express gratitude, um, all of these things you can do uh, at a shrine. There is also a, a domestic shrine called a kamidana. It's like a little miniature shrine that you can have in your home. And a good number of families in Japan have kamidana in their house. Um, so do some businesses, particularly um, kamidana for the kami uh, inari, inari o kami. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a kami uh, strongly associated with business, with prosperity. Um, and so you'll see that in a lot of um, offices and, and right. businesses, craft rooms, things like that. Mm -hmm. So practicing Shinto outside of Japan is really tricky if you don't live near a shrine. Right. And yeah. so while in Japan, it's very easy for, comparatively easy, let's say, mm -hmm. for p someone in Japan to stop by a shrine on their way home, on their way to work. Uh, maybe they're going through a particularly difficult time. And, you know, you can just pop over to a Shinto shrine. There are mm -hmm. probably several in somebody's neighborhood. And, you know, say a little prayer or just stand quietly and think. Uh, many people have different approaches to Shinto. It's not, you know, there's only one way to do things. Mm. Um, but outside of Japan, it, it, it takes a lot more work. You have to think yeah. ahead. Okay, how am I going to uh, interface with, uh, with, with the kami? How am I going to perform rituals? And so outside of Japan, uh, I see a lot more focus on the kamidana or the, oh. the altar within the home and, and most of the ritual uh, concentrated on that. Mm -hmm. um, these materials can be really difficult to get outside of Japan. And that's something that I've been, been studying, how people um, form networks in order to get the, the materials that they need mm -hmm. to perform rituals um, to enshrine the kami within their home. It's, it's very difficult. You do need to get some materials specifically from a shrine. Mm. Um, and so and so they adapt other other things mm -hmm. about the altars. Yeah. Um, but getting back to your question, the ritual practice at a kamidana often is mirrors what you would see in a Shinto right. shrine. There are offerings given to the kami of uh, rice, water, salt, um, sake mm -hmm. sometimes, uh, evergreen branches, that sort of thing. And a lot of um, transnational Shinto practitioners outside of Japan uh, use norito. Um, to to communicate with the kami, these these formula. There's actually a translated book in English put out by one of the big shrines in the mainland U.S., uh, Tsubaki uh, Grand Shrine of America, that um, trans uh, national Shinto practitioners use. And so there is a lot more intentionality that I see in online Shinto communities, specifically because it's so difficult to just casually interact with a Shinto priest, go to a Shinto shrine. Um, ask for a prayer or a ritual to be done on your behalf. It's a lot more mm, do it yourself. Right. So <clears throat> now here, here in Hawaii, we have uh, two or three shrines, I think. I can't remember if it's two or three. There's at least one here on Oahu, and there's at least one. Yeah, yeah there's a handful on, um, of them. 
on Hawaii Island. But, um, but you know, that, that comes from the whole big, you know, Japanese American community here. There were a lot of Japanese immigrants that came. And so, of course, you know, they established the shrines and they've been here for, I don't know, like 100 years or more. Um, and, and so as, as the generations, you know, kind of come and, and go, you know, you, you start to get like intermarriage. And, and, but nevertheless, a lot of these Japanese American families still kind of maintain some traditions, some links to the shrines, and, and they might go for special events and all that. But what about like in, in other places outside of Hawaii? I think Hawaii is particularly influence has that strong connection to, to Japan but what what kinds of other individuals have you seen you know in, in in your research like that identify as Shinto what what kind of draws them to to that that's such a great question yes Hawaii is one of the kind of centers still of, of Shinto practice in the Japanese diaspora um, mm-hmm. Historically speaking, there have been um, hundreds, thousands even of overseas shrines either connected to the Japanese diaspora or um, modern Japanese imperialism during uh, the World Wars period. Mm-hmm. Um, there is uh, Izumu Taishakyo in Hawaii, Kodohira yes. Jinja, Hawaii Dazaifu Temangu. That's a long one. Yes. Uh, those were both established in the early 1900s. And mm-hmm. if anybody wants to learn more about um, these shrines in Hawaii, my amazing mm-hmm. colleague Carly Shimizu is a researcher at Hokkaido University. She focuses on, on Hawaii. Um, there's also a, a larger community of Shinto practitioners in Brazil because it's such mm-hmm. a, a center of uh, Japanese diaspora. True, yeah. So my focus, um, since there's already research on Hawaii and um, in Brazil and to a lesser extent in in Korea, uh, Taiwan and other um, previously colonized territories Mm. um, is is these online communities. My surveys so far have uh, given me kind of an idea of the demographics. It's very hard Mm. um, to pin down demographics in an online setting right. without access to like backend logs and things like that. There are a number of constraints mm-hmm. uh, for digital stuff, especially because I interact with a lot of people through their profile pictures, mm. their avatars, things like that. Right. Uh, there's sometimes not a lot of face to face communication, mm-hmm. but uh, 70% of the people who responded to my survey about Kamidana ritual practice mm-hmm. uh, in 2019, 70% are based in the mainland United States. Mm-hmm. Um, about 20% were in the UK. And then the rest really came from all over the globe. Mm. Um, so a lot of my work focuses on the mainland United States because outside of Hawaii and Brazil and Asia, um, there are only a few shrines set up. There are three currently, maybe four in the mainland United States. Mm-hmm. There's one, maybe two in Canada. There's definitely one in Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. And there's one in the Republic of San Marino um, oh. on the Italian peninsula as well. <laughs> um, so I primarily have been, been speaking with the, the shrines in the mainland United States. Um, because that's where I'm centered sure. and that's the easiest um, to uh, converse with. And also for a period of time, I worked with the priest of um, Shusei Inari Shrine of America mm-hmm. in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. um, working with them on, on their media and their live streaming during the pandemic. So, yeah, what um, attracts primarily Caucasian, mm. let's say Americans mm. and European folks mm-hmm. um, to to Shinto. I think it's a number of reasons that have really coalesced because a, a, f- a lot of people have asked me why Shinto and not other traditions, mm-hmm. let's say, or other religions. Uh, why not Western paganism mm. or, you know, Hellenism, Interesting, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. New Age stuff. I mean, there, there's a lot of options in this global you know, world that we live in. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the Internet, there's so much information out there to learn about them. So Shinto is kind of at the nexus of a lot of different things. Um, for example, uh, Shinto affirms appreciation and concern for nature and the environment. That's really important to a lot of the folks in online Shinto communities. This is arguably more of a contemporary focus in Shinto today, this kind of green Shinto movement. Mm. Uh, my colleague Aika Rotz has a fantastic book, Shinto, Nature and Ideology in Contemporary Japan, mm. on Shinto and forests and kind of this green Shinto paradigm. 
Um, so on top of this kind of green focus, it provides ritual practice to people who really enjoy ritual. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a lot of people, even Christians that I've spoken to feel like this is something lacking, particularly in like Protestant Christian mm -hmm. traditions. Um, you know, ritual provides concrete ways of, of doing things, of engaging with the world, with supernatural entities. Um, it provides routine during the day. It's a time to mm. focus. Um, there, I think during the pandemic, especially we've all realized how our routines and our daily rituals impact our life and how much like mm -hmm. stability um, they can bring. And so ritual practice is definitely um, a, a plus for <laughs> choosing Shinto over other um, traditions. Mm -hmm. Also a direct relationship with the kami, with the deities um, through the kami dana, I think is very attractive, um, particularly for people who are more familiar with religions that require an True. intercessor. Yeah. Um, like mm -hmm. Catholicism. There also Shinto's avowed lack of doctrine um, is a, a selling point, let's say, mm. for Shinto. Uh, for example, there's no express teaching in Shinto that would, um, you know, be against like LGBTQ mm. folks, um, people who are neurodiverse, mm -hmm. atypical in other mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. Um, not to say that everyone in online Shinto communities is in the LGBTQ true, true, community yeah, yeah. Um, or on the spectrum yeah. or something like that. Um, but I have spoken to a lot of people um, in interviews and such who have said they've really found a positive affirming community um, in the Shinto mm -hmm. community that they didn't have um, at home in their families, oftentimes nominally or um, extremely uh Evangelical Christian mm -hmm. families, mm -hmm. for example. So, so the the lack mm -hmm. of judgment um, perceived from Shinto um, is definitely a plus. And lastly, mm -hmm. just like with Marie Kondo, uh, there's the appeal of Japanese culture. I've spoken to many people who've mentioned that they became interested in Shinto when they uh, were touring through Japan and visited a shrine. And, you know, the, the feeling of being in the shrine or interacting with a priest or witnessing a ritual was really mm. impactful in their lives. So much so that they decided to dedicate, you know, a significant amount of time and effort um, to becoming Shinto practitioners. Um, also, many people have become interested in Shinto through manga and anime and video games. Um, there's nothing particularly yeah. wrong with that. Um, but the appeal of Japanese culture is definitely one vehicle through which people are first learning that Shinto is a thing <laughs> and mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. learning more about it. And then some people even deciding to become uh, practitioners. That yeah, becomes yeah, yeah. a little tricky on the opposite side because um, Japan, the Japanese government has a whole program of uh, cool Japan, you know, marketing right. Japan for tourism and their entertainment media and, you know, Shinto imagery is a big part of this. But I don't know that they knew ahead of time that people would take the Shinto um, content so seriously. Mm. And so when I talk to Shinto priests and, and just regular folks in Japan about uh, Shinto practitioners, you know, <laughs> look like me. Uh, for those who can't see me, I'm, I'm, I have red hair. I'm extremely <laughs> pale. <laughs> uh, that people, people who look like me might be interested in, in practicing Shinto actually mm -hmm. Go take the time to to contact a shrine, enshrine a particular kami in their home, mm -hmm. um, to you know give regular offerings and and such. Uh, they're they're really shocked. <laughs> um, but thinking about all of these different threads that come together, I'm kind of like, of course this happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How yeah, could it yeah, be yeah. any other way? Um, of yeah. course. Yeah, I mean, I. It's really it's really interesting. I I don't. I mean, I'm probably I, I first really became aware of Shinto through anime. I mean, I'm, I'm almost certain that that's kind of how it went. So so did I. Yeah, that's it's just <laughs> such a and like, I mean, Shinto and, and you know, like the Nadi, for example, there, there's tons of different, you know, like Fox characters. There's so much to uh, use from, you know, the, the, the kind of stories of, of Japanese creation and all these things that are used in anime and, and they're great stories. So it, it's just natural that, you know, they've kind of uh, established themselves within the pop culture side of things as well. And, and you know, I mean, hey, they're yeah, fun. Exactly. They're fun stories too. So, um, 
So anime, let, let's let's briefly. I, I I mean, we've already gone. I think we're coming around forty minutes. But your 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 YouTube channel, I love it. Um, I, I've watched a bunch of videos. Um, uh, the the most recent one is very much related to what we're talking about. I think it's like anime pilgrimages and anime characters becoming kami, and, and uh, it it's just it's a great channel. I love it. Um, could you tell us a bit about it and and what you do there? Thank you so much. Perfect segue. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so my, my YouTube channel, Eat, Pray, Anime, explores the religious culture and history behind our favorite Japanese media. So not just anime, although, you know, I, I was trying to come up with a catchy title, uh, but also yeah. uh, different kinds of popular culture like video games, manga, Western comics, television. Mm -hmm. We were just talking about how there's so many Fox characters this week. Uh, I'm playing through Genshin Impact. There is a new uh, expansion in this free online uh, MMO game. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a ton of Fox figures everywhere. There's so much mm -hmm. Unari content. I'm, I'm in heaven. Uh, but <laughs> the goal of the, the channel is to dive more deeply into the religious and cultural elements that we see both in the foreground and the background of the media that we enjoy from Japan. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, we see all these myths and characters based on, on deities and all sorts of really interesting stuff. Um, but when do we ever really get to dive more into, like, what are those inspirations? Where do they come from? Uh, what mm -hmm. do they mean? So my channel is kind of a place where we can all learn more about Japan and ourselves and uh, religion in general in the process. I realized going through college myself and then as an educator um, that there are so many people who are interested in learning about this kind of stuff, but it's so difficult to really learn about it mm. more than you could learn from a, a Wikipedia page, yeah, for example. Yeah. Um, and there's so much er like just poorly researched content out there. Mm. Uh, so I, I decided <laughs> to fix that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I've been in the same situation where I couldn't fit a course on anime into my schedule when I was in college. And that was as an East Asian studies major, mm. you know, when I should have time to study these things. And university is so expensive. And it could be really hard for students and parents to say, like, sure, yeah, spend, you know, three hours a week learning about anime when we're paying tens of thousands right, of dollars. Right, right. <laughs> A year for you to get a degree. <laughs> and on top of that, there's people who haven't been in a classroom for decades and still have, you know, a passion and a curiosity course, yeah. about Jap Japanese culture. So I asked myself, you know, like, how can I keep educating these people and, and share what I'm interested in and what I know um, through the benefit of, you know, going through a PhD and everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I figured the answer was YouTube. I started writing for the channel Religion for Breakfast mm -hmm. run by uh, Dr. Andrew Mark Henry. Mm -hmm. I wrote the introduction to Shinto series for his um, uh, channel. And it was amazing. Within half an hour, thousands of people had watched my intro to Shinto video. Mm. Like I maybe teach 60 people on a <laughs> weekly basis for uh -huh. a quarter. Sure, like sure. I, I don't know if I'll ever teach that many people in the classroom that I, that I was able to teach through those videos on, on YouTube. And so I'm kind of throwing myself into this. It's been about almost a year now because yeah. somehow I thought starting a YouTube channel was a great way to <laughs> spend the pandemic. <laughs> Like, overworked PhD student. Yeah, I can add one more thing. I know, I know, yeah. So, uh, some upcoming episodes... <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah. Grad school. I mean, I, I, I didn't, I didn't make it all the way to PhD. I stopped after a master's, but uh, oh my god, you know, I know how busy and crazy and stressful that can be. And and now you're, you got a YouTube channel. So. I don't know how anybody with a full time job starts a YouTube yeah. channel. It's, it's really hard. But I'm sorry, I interrupted uh, you. But please, some please, upcoming. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's yeah. fine. Um, just to keep yeah. it short, I have some upcoming episodes. I'll be uh, posting the second episode in the anime pilgrimage mm -hmm. series soon um more playthroughs mm -hmm. of uh, sakuna of rice and ruin and genshin impact which are games that i play on the playstation mm -hmm. 4 um and a an episode a, an introduction to the history of miko or shinto mm -hmm. shrine maidens mm -hmm. um so content really runs the gamut yeah. Uh, I do Let's Plays. Mm. I call it Let's Play with an Expert, where I play. So you get to watch the content, especially if you don't play mm. games or have console. Um, and also get some educational stuff. You know, I'll comment on things. And then I have the more traditional long-form content. Mm. So, yeah. I mean, there's so many things that I want to make a video about. It's only a matter yeah, of time. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope... 
that uh, people in your audience will will join me on this journey. Uh, I think it's a great supplement to the uh, Japan Station podcast. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I will. I, like I said, I'm happy to promote it. I I myself, I did a. A, a bachelor's degree in Asian studies and religious studies. So I've always had this interest in, in the religious side of things, but also for a very, you know, since I was a kid, I've been watching anime too. So it's this perfect kind of intersection of stuff that I like. So happy to promote it, happy to get the word out and put some links in the show notes. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. It was, it was a pleasure talking to you and, and I would love to talk some other time more about anime and stuff with you. So <laughs> thank you. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for having me. If you want to go check out Caitlin's article about Marie Kondo, go check out the link in the show notes. It's called The Untidiness of Marie Kondo's Eclectic Spirituality. You can find it on Google or just link in the show notes, japanstationpodcast.com, either way. And also, don't forget to check out Eat, Pray, Anime. Again, if you like what I'm doing here, I think there's a pretty good chance that you're going to enjoy the kinds of videos that she produces over there. Go support her. Hit that subscribe button. Hit some like buttons. I totally think she should be getting so many more views than she is getting right now. I think there's so much wonderful information in there. And it's coming from somebody that has spent years researching this and, well, has basically made it her career. So really, really reliable, in-depth uh, analyses of anime and video games and all this uh, fun stuff that a lot of us really, really enjoy. Again, eat pray anime link in the show notes japanstationpodcast.com or just go to youtube and put that in the search bar <laughs> it'll pop up right away um so if you have any questions or comments send them over to mail at japanstationpodcast.com and also remember to follow on facebook and twitter at japankyo news remember to follow subscribe whatever it is in your podcast app that helps immensely rate and review and tell a friend about the show and uh, also if you're doing any shopping on amazon make Make sure to use japankyo.com slash Amazon. Again, japankyo.com slash Amazon won't cost you anything extra. A few extra little pennies will come my way so that I can keep talking into this microphone and bringing you more content about Japan. <laughs> um, I, I have noticed a few people seem to be using it. Um, thank you so, so much. In particular, I, I know Todd, he emailed me. Todd, hey, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, has been using it quite a bit. So I really, 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 really do appreciate that. Uh, again, japanko.com slash Amazon. Uh, as always, thank you to You Know Me for providing the opening and closing song. And that does it for this episode. Uh, don't forget to check out the latest episode of Ichimon Japan. Uh, that one is all about um, Japanese toilet ghosts and hands coming out of Japanese toilets and uh, Hanako-san and Kappa with arms that fall off very easily and uh, really funny stuff. <laughs> So go check that out. Again, link in the show notes. The, the uh, title, I think, is uh, Why Do Hands Come Out of Japanese Toilets or something like that. So <laughs> go check that out. Uh, again, thank you so much for listening. And remember, go find your miniature pony. Just do it! <laughs>